Hello, everyone. I'm here again to do another interview for the uh, Circumcision Harms documentary. And I, today I have William Spin with me. William, you want to um, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're involved with this? Well, um, I remember a time in my life that I literally didn't know why there was two different color skin there. Like it was boggling. I was just like, I wonder why. And then I ignored it. And then I think in my 30s, uh, I saw that David Reimer documentary and it was like, oh, wow, that, that really did happen. And that's why. And I got a little bit angry with my mother. She was already old. And I said, mom, you know, it really would have been nicer if you just give me a choice in life. But I left it at that. And I didn't know anymore. Just that I was deprived of a choice. And she was old. And at the time when I was a child, they thought it cured penis cancer. It was like, it's all junk, you know? And early COVID, I just, I was like, I wonder what the difference is. I was dating a new woman who was very international and very open and very just sensual. I mean, and I just I was just looking at things on the internet and what's the difference? Just curious, what's the difference? Once you start looking into what's the difference, that, that Georgetown University lecture, it took me two days to watch it because I kept pausing it and looking up things that Dr. McAllister covered. And every time it's like, he's actually kind about how he puts things and gentle. <laughs> and he doesn't put the worst case scenarios. He doesn't, he just gently breaks it to the audience. And when you really dig into it, it's a million times worse than any of these led on to be it's it's literally horrible it is and yeah you're referring to the elephant in the hospital which people yeah, find yeah out but exactly the, the dr McAllister lecture that's been sent around so many times and changed lives of so many people and it's like why isn't this on national news i mean I, and now you know it's it's medical fraud and they're gonna have to take it to take it to court yeah. literally to get anything out um in any kind of public light it's just horrible. Yeah. And I, I've since in the eight months since I went through that awakening, like, uh, like my brother Kay said, or was it Seth? I don't remember. He goes, people have two lives, like one life before and then another one after they realize it's a scam. It's, it's a total absolute violation of human rights. And it feels like that. And I've told some people and you could see them like their eyes just, they turn white and pale and they just, their, their head, you know, shuts off and yeah. others, they go into that mode of denial. I mean, and for some reason, when I was going through watching different documentaries on it, I, I suddenly remembered like, oh, my parents did this to me when I was like two. Oh. And there, there's a good, like, gosh, 30 years of my, 30, 38 years of my life, 40 years that I don't even remember it. It like literally suppressed memories are real. Yeah, and and then in in a month and a half time, every single memory came back, like wow. arguments. My dad was intact, and he was pushing for me to remain intact. And I, I probably was about two, and I remember my mom badgering him, and she was like, "Oh, it's just skin, and the pediatrician says it'll be better for him, and you don't want him to get." penile cancer do you and on and on and on I mean just she would not relent and honestly she was kind of the alpha in the relationship between my parents she was a retired air force pilot and my dad was a carpenter and and I remember him just getting beat up over it and and he just buckled and they I wrote that paper about it it, it took me a week and a half yeah, to write that paper. it's only two pages then the only other memories that came back were, were the badgering. I mean, my mom beating my dad up over it. Like he has to get this done. He has to get this done. And, and then my dad leaving the room because they both went to the hospital. And um, I remember him just becoming really uncomfortable and leaving. And then lots of blacking out after that. But it, it was- So you were two. I don't know how old I was because okay. I've never had kids. And I kids grew up at different ages. Yeah. I know I was- uh, like 10.6 pounds when I was born. And at kindergarten, I was as big as a first grader. Hmm. I am guessing too, because my mom said a crib never held me. Yeah. I read like at a 
high school level by kindergarten. And then by the end of elementary school, I read on a university level and I was just ahead of every other child for everything that I ever learned and did. Um, bought my house when I was 25. I've just been ahead of other people sort of. So I don't know. I, I'm just guessing it too, but I remember I could bathe myself. I remember after they did it, I lowered myself into the bath and it was like ungodly fire. So you fire. have pretty vivid memories of it then. It They gradually came back to like full, like yeah. everything came back, but it wasn't like poof and it came back. It, it was very gradual. Yeah. So those memories, something in my head happened and it literally buried them because they were inaccessible. And then yeah. after reading it about it and everything, it's like it, my brain started digging through that. Yeah. And then I remember the argument with my mom and it, I essentially, I think I was two and I was giving her an intactivist argument because it, <laughs> it was like, um, well, why did you do this to me? And I remember I, I was a little freaky pervert little two-year-old even now today. Yeah. I mean, and I would jam Star Wars guys like like in my friend, I'm like, friend, I don't know how to say it, but I remember playing with it. Yeah, and it was gone. Yeah, it was just gone. And um, I was like, put it back. And I knew it. I knew it was gone. I was just fucking with my mom, like, put it back, put it back. This is not right. And she's like, well, you don't want to die of cancer. It could kill you. And I'm like, mom, yeah. it hasn't happened yet. I'm yeah. whatever age. And I know I wasn't in school. I mean, I was still playing with my stuffed animals. And, you know, I think yeah. it was like 77, 78. I was probably about two to two and a half, yeah. I think. Yeah. But not in school yet and definitely i tried to walk out of there i remember i wrote that down that uh i was trying to walk i was very angry and um my dad carried me it was probably the last time he ever carried me and and uh, pictures all my childhood pictures very early i'm smiling and then there's no other picture of me smiling in existence ever oh, since man. then so i don't know if that created some type of anger inside or what yeah. but it, it definitely did some type of change you know that i wasn't may not have been aware of but i, I don't know and and you'd think that the u.s would have corrected itself mm -hmm. that's what's really a pisser is, is the united states should have looked at the global what are other countries doing? even canada stopping it. Yeah. mexico never did it like yeah. we're surrounded by people that look at us like freaks yeah and yeah. the uk they, stopped it decades ago yeah I don't think it ever was prevalent in Mexico, right? Like it just no, never... no, I, yeah. In fact, I, I have a, vi a video or two of a Mexican doctor that you know, yeah, they don't do it down. There. And I, I was a padrino in a Mexican wedding. It's like a Mexican best man, it was an only white dude, and um, I didn't know padrinos have like a bunch of Mexican, a bunch of guys become the best man. And uh, I, I'm very close to some Latin American families here living in San Antonio, and I asked him, I showed him that documentary, and he. You know that never do this to kids, right? This guy I'm very good friends with. And he replied, and he's got like eight brothers and they have literally at least 25, 30 grandkids. And he goes, no one in my family does that. We do yeah. not fall for that white man American scam. Adamantly, like he's just like, it's a fact. We don't do it. And his parents are from Guadalajara. And he's just, he's like, it's an idiot white people thing. Like what the hell are you, you know? But I've noticed living in San Antonio, the more Americanized the Latino families become, the more apt they are to do that. Yeah. Or the more we're going to be Americanized or we're going to be like the upscale, whatever. Once they kind of leave their culture, you know, yeah. and they become more Americanized, they just, yeah, they'll do it. Because I've asked a couple Latin friends, and one's a, a fire chief, and he's very Americanized and he had a mental breakdown about, Oh my God, what have I done to my sons? And, and we were on a bike ride. I just talked to him. Hey, you should work, read this, watch this. You might save a life. You're a fire chief, you know? Yeah. And he's like, what, why, why is this not after the, after he watched it, he's why is this not in any of the EMT and medical training? Why is it not in any medical anything? And the guy's practically a nurse at his level. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, I've never ever read this in any type of medical. And he's in charge of hundreds of firefighters and EMTs. Yeah. And he's never, ever been told that. It's possible that they'll go in and find a baby that's bleeding, you know, to death inside of its diaper, you know? Yeah. Oh, he, he fell on a knife. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's uh, there's actually a intactivist that's very active on Twitter, uh, Just Wonko, J U A N C H O. He uh, he's Mexican and uh, and I guess his parents were wealthy and they thought that it was you know a good thing, so they they got him cut. And he's he's very vehemently angry that he was cut. And mm-hmm. yeah, he says that it's, it's very rare, but it does happen, and it's. It's a an appeal to you know looking wealthy or whatever. There is something in men's heads that blocks it out that we just don't like. They're not open. So I remember about ten years ago, I heard another intactivist speech, and I didn't even know what it was. And this guy Dennis, that I mountain bike with in the past, uh, he'd never met a group of cyclists ever first time we're sitting around a campfire after a mountain bike ride and he's like I was born in rural Missouri and uh, never saw the inside of another building until I was like four or five um, basically he literally grew up in the woods of Missouri like shoeless like a you know he, he's a data architect now he's a very intelligent guy mm-hmm. and and when he went into the doctor at like whatever first time at like four or five the doctor's like oh let's take care of that and his dad was like no whoa 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 if he wants to do that later, that's on him. You're not touching my boy. Yeah. Done. He's intact and he's white and he grew up in Missouri. Um, and then fast forward many years, he went to the Navy and same thing. Like he was 19 years old or something. He goes in for a Navy physical and the doctor's like, oh, let's take care of that. He's sharing this with a group of cyclists he's never met. And he's like, you, the Navy doctor, you want to do what to me? Well, whoa, 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 let me go do some research. You say it's all good and stuff, but before you do that to my favorite thing, I really want to learn. And he went on a learning wow. binge like 12 years ago. He's about 40, maybe 20 years ago, he went on a learning binge. And he's like, you know, I, I went and read all this stuff and there are no benefits. It's all faked. Like yeah. we told the, the Navy doctor, no, you're not going to do this. And there's about 10 guys sitting around at the campfire in the bike ride. One old man, uh, he's since passed away and he, he just yelled, yeah, it's a scam. Back in my day, they said it prevented gout or something. He, he was the only guy that like <laughs> smiled, was pissed off. Like, you know, this, this all bullshit. Yeah. There was another guy there, this guy, Mike, and he literally almost went into the bushes and cried. Like he put his hand in his head. He's like, oh, Dennis, don't tell me this. Don't tell me this. He had just yeah. had a son recently and yeah. He just, he's like, I can't, I can't, don't, don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Mm-hmm. And that was that he just, he literally blocked it out. And all I, I remember the time and I thought, huh, I wonder if Dennis is right or if he's crazy, I should go home and look it up. And I never did. I just never went on a learning binge. It was just like a little bit of curiosity. Yeah. I just didn't. And then uh, on Facebook, I, I tagged the guy that was in that mountain bike group that night it, it, many years later. Cause I put a picture of a, let's say men in front of the Alamo. And um, I was like, I remembered your conversation, Dennis, because he actually said, yeah, why would I want to cut it off? That's kind of like the best part. And that's that his comment is one of the most troubling because it's a guy I've known for 10 years and he doesn't fly. He's a big dopey guy from Minnesota. And he just, the way he's, why would you cut it off? It's like the best part. And um Oh my God. I, I take it as fact because we're friends and I've known him for so long and he's on his second Asian wife now. Um, but that, that conversation literally made one guy just run off with his head into his hands. Like, Oh God, I don't want to hear this. Yeah. And when I tagged him on the picture of the blood same man, he blocked me on Facebook. He didn't reply. Cause I was like, Hey Mike, yeah. you remember that conversation? No, he blocked me. He didn't reply. Blocked both of us. I'm not talking to us anymore. Just like, that that just talking about it makes him so uncomfortable he can't even like communicate with us. Yeah. So yeah. some men just don't they can't. And and people ask why men don't complain. Well, men do. And it's just a small number of us that do. Yeah. The rest of us have to go high because they can't face yeah. the you know can't face the, their um victims and their own victimhood and other victims. So but at the same time, we we need to speak out so we can help put an end to this, so it doesn't happen to the next generation. You can actually get out of a speeding ticket being an intactivist. You get pulled over, and you know, 
ask the cop, you, you know, in your position, you, it might be possible for you to save a life that's in danger and just go into an interactivist speech. Mm-hmm. And I, I've done this to three cops, one coach, <laughs> um, one speeding ticket that was going to happen and it didn't. Um, and then another cop on a, a bike group event and um, different reactions across the board. But out of all the different groups that I've ever like approached, well, medical professionals are the worst. They're either staunchly pro intactivist or staunchly cutter. There's mm-hmm. very seldom a medical professional is like kind of on the fence. There's one that was like, well, I don't have an opinion. It's there's evidence on both sides. Yeah, whatever. Um, but m- a lot of the ones were pro intactivist. There, there were very few that were the one that was pro cutter doesn't talk to me anymore. I send them a bunch of stuff and they just blocked me. Like yeah. they were like, don't, don't come at me with that anti-vaxxer stuff. Yeah. I was like, whoa, hold on a minute. <laughs> like, it's not anti-vaccines. Not about vaccines. Yeah. yeah, it's nothing to do with vaccines at all. Um, yeah. But you, you, I've told this to cops, and I, I know I sent some of them down a rabbit hole, just like the firefighter. They're like, what? Why didn't we know? You know, yeah. and they're, they're taking notes. And yeah. just like Brother K said, like, a lot of the officers are actually interested in learning. You know, most police are good, and they want to do good for the better of humanity. And it's not something they've heard of. You know that, that wow, this actually kills. So isn't that technically murder? I mean, if a if a hospital goes, yeah, he could die. They know he could die, and they yeah. do it anyway. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's without a medical indication. Yeah, it's, it's not like you're comparing risk for risk, really. You yeah. Know, think, okay. Well, there, if we don't no operate him, then he might die because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his his penis will come up and strangle him or kill him. Like, yeah. It's in some of the statistics. No male has ever died from a foreskin related like problem at infant level i'm sure oh you're old and you get gangrene that's a whole different thing yeah. you know wait till you're old and get gangrene that's that don't do it to a child it just doesn't make sense yeah yeah i mean the, the most that i've heard of is like um kidney problems because the urine doesn't escape the bladder but even in a case like that you don't have to do a full prepucial amputation you don't have to remove you know the entire prepuce off of the glands in order to be able to release the, the urine from the bladder Somewhere on, on one of the Intactivist websites, there's a urologist's webpage. Have you seen that guy's page where he posts about his work page and he's got a huge blog about the decade he's been doing reconstructive surgeries on children. And it's just like pages and pages and pages from this urologist saying, stop doing this. I will do my profession the best I can but I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't yeah. have to do this, but there's, there's days and he's in a cutter state. He's like in Ohio or Illinois or something in New York. And he's like, I shouldn't be having to do like eight of these a day sometimes or four a day yeah. or, or whatever it is. Reconstructive surgeries on children that didn't have to be done. Yeah. Uh, yep, I that, hear plenty of that. That's just how can America keep doing this to kids? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll, turn this around somehow some way so well i have a list of things that i try to cover for each of these interviews um they're broken up in in an order that kind of makes sense where one causes the other which causes the other which causes the other um so i want to go over them with you uh i'll just give the top the top items uh first the physical harms um and then the um, how it affects sexual relationships, um, which is due to the physical harms, and then the psychological effects, which again is due to the harms, and then um, how this the whole um, virtual cutting in the world affects relationships, and then the last couple of things uh, we talk a little bit about female genital mutilation and and uh, social productivity. So um, the the physical kind of gets you know down and dirty a little bit, and uh, I usually use this to talk a little bit about the physical harms. And as a, as we go over it, you know, if if it applies to you or if you have something to say about it, please uh, please say so. I might even ask you a specific question. So <clears throat> the first uh, the first item I, I talk about is is the acropostion and. Uh, John Geisiker from Doctors of Floating Circumcision, he talks about it in one of the videos that's on my YouTube channel. Uh, he 
he went to uh, Bellevue with me to host uh, uh, your whole baby uh, information booth at a baby fair. And he did a presentation, about a half an hour or so presentation to try to explain the mechanics of the penis and how it's supposed to work and all that when it has all the parts intact. And he shows uh, an image of a, uh, a, I think it's a Greek statue that shows a man that's intact. And he has uh, you know, the little bit of skin hanging past his glands and referred to that as the agroposteum. And supposedly uh, in biblical times, that's what was removed. Not everything that covers the glands, but just the skin uh, on past the glands. And I think that's where the word foreskin actually originally came from. This is not the foreskin. This is the prepuce. The skin that hangs you know, past the, the glands would be the foreskin, which makes sense. The word for, you know, being before the penis. So it's just become a common part of lay terminology. So I'm assuming that um, you got a full prepucial amputation. Whatever the like the Greeks called it the radical or something, the full, yeah. The yeah. most common in America. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yep. Yep. Oh, and so. I remember my mom joking, don't, don't, sh don't kick. You don't want him to mess it up. Mm. Yeah. And the guy turning to him, her, does this look okay? <sighs> that was one of the horrible memories that the literally the, the kind of, Get, you know, hospital tech or whatever's doing it, turning to my mother, like, does this look okay? Like, yeah. what in the, and she's an intelligent woman. Like, not, why didn't it snap in her head at the time? Yeah, it's the 70s, whatever, but still. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, well, back then they, they didn't, there weren't, you know, books. You can just go into the library and pull up books and read about it. No internet, then, yeah. Have, yeah, definitely not any internet. And uh, the, a little bit of information that I, I understand was in the library was like from Dr. Kellogg or, you know, <laughs> Redmond Dindo or one of those doctors yeah. from, you know, the 1800s. It's evil. Get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, they were thinking that masturbation was bad or whatever, or even, you know, doctors that talked about, you know, you know they'll go blind from masturbation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So they didn't have all the, you know, they had to appeal to the doctor's authority and, you know, they hear something like, well, it prevents, um, penile cancer. Well, <laughs> um, what else are you going to cut out to prevent, you know, the possibility of cancer, especially when, you know, they only have a one in a thousand chance, lifetime chance of ever having penile cancer. Well, you know, women have a one in eight chance of breast cancer. You're going to, what else are you going to cut off before yeah. that you know, possibility comes along? Everything can get infection. Every single exactly. part of your body. Yeah. Every little part. Uh, so um, I'm since you've done so much studying, I'm sure you get that it's sensitive skin that was removed. Um, yeah. And you were two years old or whatever. So you might, you probably even remember that, you know, if you felt something there. It wasn't oh, yeah. like, it's not like fingernails uh, or hair that has no nerves. I, I remember it. jamming an action figure in there. Yeah. Like, and you, I'm like, sure you felt it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't want the ones with the pointy feet. You wanted with the roundy feet. <laughs> you know, like a little action figure that was like more smooth, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know if I experimented more than kids, the other kids, but I know I did. Yeah. Um, you know, for a long time. And um, I, I, there was this talk show host. He actually had a couple guys, um, with foreskins on a show, and they did a test to see how many skittles or you know, they they could hold inside of their foreskin or their prepuce. So, yeah. Even even adult males do some funny things with it, but. It shouldn't be taken away from us. Yep. So, uh, glands protection. So, question: Have you done any restoration or tried restoration? No, not yet. Okay. Yeah. My wife yanks a lot. I mean, it, and I, when I'm cold, I have a little tiny bit of coverage, but not yeah. anywhere near a restored guy. Yeah. I keep yeah, telling her, you, you need to work on this because she grabs me more than I do. I mean, she's always on. So, um, it's just something I need to, and I, I'm kind of dreading it because I've read so many different like stories of ow, 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 you know? Yeah. This is something I need to really get on because there's other guys who are like, wow, this is like HD television as opposed to the black and white that I had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Yeah, <gasps> multiple men that got cut as adults say, you know, say that kind of thing in color versus black and white, stuff like that. So, yeah. So uh, there's no glands protection when you don't have it. So your glands, which is supposed to be an internal, you know, recovered part of the body, much like your tongue. You know, maybe you, maybe you stick it out for certain things, but then it goes back in. Um, it's funny how people refer to turtle necks. It's like, well, imagine taking the skin off of the darn turtle. You know, a turtle's neck. <laughs> turtle dies in a shell. Yeah. Yeah, and I I know people joke about it, and they think you know they do it in a derogatory term, but reality is that's how nature made us, and that's how we're supposed to be. So. Yep. Um, rolling mechanism. So I'm assuming you're missing out, like I am, on that rolling mechanism, which kind yeah. of uh, it's another form of allowing things to move as they're supposed to and less uh, less friction. So like you know, when when you're inserting um, into the vagina or anus or whatever, there's you know move that far and in, inside without actually having to slide. I mean, and, you know, no rubbing to, to get inside. So that's the rolling mechanism. Um, no moisture or lube on the glands. It's dried out. Uh, so you can't provide, you can't add um, the lube to the act with your partner. Uh, frenulum gets cut one way or another to varying degrees, depending on how you're cut. For me, I have, I, I'm pretty sure I was cut with a, uh, a, a Mugen clamp, um, where they pull the skin up and then they cut just uh, on, over the, the glands. And so what gets pulled up is um, shaft skin, the outer skin, the outer layer, and the, the inner mucosa remains. So when my penis gets erect, I have pretty much all my inner mucosa and um, the, the skin from my frenular area. So I have that sensitivity for the most part, but of course my frenulum was snipped so it wouldn't pull back up on the skin, All right? Uh, ridged band, that's the part, it's kind of like your lips, right? The part that goes from the- Or the edge of an eyelid, yeah. Yeah, to the outer skin. And I understand that's really innervated and, uh, and the, there's a kind of muscular action to the, the prep use where it closes off and tightens near the end. Um, and that kind of creates like a one-way valve for urine to go out, but nothing is supposed to be able to get back in and to cause an infection. And uh, the ridge band is you know, kind of where that tightens up, but during sex and, uh, and um, and erections and everything like that, that starts stretching out. And just that motion of stretching out, uh, from what I understand, is, is a sensation in itself. Uh, so some of the effects of missing these things uh, is like hairy shaft, often referred to, as, uh, it comes from scrotal webbing, or since you don't have the prep used to roll down onto the onto the penis, you, uh, when your erection occurs, you're, you're pulling up on your scrotum and pulling up on your, um, your pelvic floor. And uh, that, you know, your scrotum is, to, when, especially when you, you know, when you get older or you're really hairy, like, you know, guys like me, <laughs> uh, the, uh, it pulls up on the scrotum and that scrotum, that hairy scrotum is, get, ends up on the shaft of the penis and it's hairy instead of smooth like you know the rest of the shaft skin is uh and in my case i haven't heard it happen to very many other men but in my case it i've seen it too i've seen it in porn but because the testes is being pulled up it pulls up on the on I mean, when the scrotum is being pulled up the testes inside the the scrotum sac is getting pulled up and like the testes will pull up to the sides of the shaft and in my case one would sometimes go inside my body and whenever that would happen i'd have to stop i, I talked to austin mercury he's got a lot of postings about that syndrome, really? the buried cock syndrome he's like i didn't even know i had this he he's one of the most moving cases that guy's very outspoken oh uh, i know that would happen to him yeah 
Have you talked to Austin Mercury? Yet? Oh yeah, I chat with him yeah, a lot. He, I mean, he's just really, really outspoken. I told him you, you have a, you need a sidecar for your balls because you've got so much courage. Just to, I mean, anybody he'll tell anybody. He posts it all the time, mm-hmm. and yep. and he's severely cut. You know, and it, for a guy to think that's normal and not realize until much later in life, it, it's literally it's a conspiracy against men. Uh, yeah, I well, I personally didn't start understanding this myself until I was 35 and I became a dad. I just kind of assumed that all these things that were happening to my penis um, and sex and everything were probably typical or whatever. Or, you know, I didn't know any difference. And I, um, it actually took me a dozen years of looking at how the normal penis works compared to the previously amputated one for me to make connections to my history. I was like, oh, I had this, I had this, I had this, I had this, and I still have this. Um, And these are all effects of not having my prep use. Uh, And that's what led me to this, putting together this list of of issues and uh, and then doing these interviews to try to show the world that, hey, I'm not alone. There are many men that have these issues and uh, most men don't know that they uh, are having issues because like me up to the age 35, it's not something you really take the time to think about or look at, or you're not talking to your buddies about, hey, you've got an intact penis. How does that work differently? guys don't talk about this stuff you know they don't talk about their junk i mean it kind of comes off weird or whatever but i've got to talk about it so we help put this put it into this i mean people hear about how um, females missing their lady or being you know uh, infibulated or whatever causes problems uh, later on for birth whatever and that drives people absolutely angry and um and, and the they, husband stitch yeah yeah exactly they hate that it's happening well uh we need to raise awareness so people also hate that this is happening to men to boys as well and hopefully put an end to all virtual general cutting in the world um so uh, a little bit on the pelvic floor again so um for, for me when my my penis becomes erect, you know, my, my corpus cavernosum is filling up with blood or whatever. Um, my penis does this instead of just going straight out, right? Because the, the skin between the top of the upper part of my penis and my pelvic floor is gets tight. So it kind of acts like a crane, right? And I can, you know, the, the, I could feel the, corpus cavernosum in the, in the tide, you know, kind of getting twisted a little bit like that. And that's not very comfortable. That's and my stock uh, comment reply. And um, for men, men are always posting in car forums about, you know, cock this, cock that. I mean, it's just like a common thing in car, in car forums and mechanic forums and tool forums. Oh, it's going sideways for whatever reason. Mine does that too or whatever. Every time a guy makes that comment about his, his junk going sideways, I follow up with the reasoning. Yep. Oh, you were cut a little bit lopsided. Look yep. at these websites. And you just, I've gotten silenced and banned from car forums. <laughs> and other times guys are like, send me more links. What's that go? What's, what are you talking? I can't believe this, you know, and yeah. mixed replies. Yeah. Nobody ever were... comes back to a comment like that with, yeah. this is why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we get presented information. I was presented with information and I kind of disappeared. Um, I'm introverted. Um, you can't tell by this chat, but I'm introverted. So after learning a little bit of information, I kind of processed the grief and everything in my own head um, by myself. And then I'd come back out of that grief and then I'd start looking some more and learn another thing and then same thing. So it took me almost a dozen years to finally say, okay, enough is enough. This is ridiculous. We need to stop it. So I started speaking out about it. So and I, I think what you're also referring to is, you know, like if, if guys are cut in uh, the wrong angle, like the clamp is put on at an angle. It's a blind off. surgery with kids. So they don't yeah. know what they're doing. They just, exactly. whatever it's looks t- okay. They're dealing mm-hmm. with something, you know, that, you know, that small uh, instead of, you know, an adult penis. So it's, yeah. it's harder to be clear about, you know, making a straight cut and all that. And so they end up with too much uh, more skin on one side than the other. And then that, but the, you know, a curved penis one way or another, right. When they get or worse. Of, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's you, know, you go to circumcisionharm.org or whatever and see all sorts of pictures and stuff that would just gross you out. But... The, the, your whole baby complications is a life altering gallery. 
oh. <laughs> things are literally that bad in America. Yeah, it, it, it's just and and most guys are not like Austin Mercury's level that they will speak out and look what happened to me, you know, and hope mm-hmm. like this is not normal, natural, or a choice yeah. at all. You call it a choice, but it's not a choice. It's it's just yeah. Not. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I yeah I covered the belt pelvic floor, uh, medial stenosis, something else I also had. Um, you understand what medial stenosis is? Yeah, yeah, I've noticed like it like longer urination times and yeah. um, just not the flow that men are supposed to have the level. Yeah. Either yeah. Um, narrowing of the of the meatus where the urine comes out. I didn't look at the percentage. It's probably pretty high, like ninety something percent or something. Um, actually, Brian Art put out a, a, a tweet. Um, linking to an article or something, it's, it sounded like it was like almost a third of I think it'd um, be more than that, boys end up with that. The irritation and the callousing. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, uh, imagine how many don't even report it, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Because it, I'm again, normal. I'm happy. I'm glad. Yeah. yeah well, you're practically born with it a certain way, and I think that I probably still have a certain level of medial stenosis. But you know, it, it took some thinking. to like. Well, you know, I have a little bit of a sharp pain. You know, it's a little uncomfortable right at the end when I urinate. I can still urinate just fine, but you know, and, and release everything. But there is a little bit of a sharp pain at the end. Now, when I was a child, I my grandmother took me into the hospital and turned out that I had a little bit of a skin bridge across the meatus that grew there, and it caused me to spray everywhere when I went pee. And the doctor just sliced that open a little bit. To, I don't remember feeling anything or whatever and that problem was resolved but still to this day i think that my meatus is probably narrower than it would be if i still had my my, uh, my prep use mm-hmm. so. uh skin bridges uh, you know how skin goes from the inner mucosa up to the glands and this happens because the body tries to um, heal itself because the inner mucosa is attached to the glands, uh, much like your fingernails adhere to your finger bed um, during childhood, and it breaks down um, to get ready for sex later on in life. Uh, and I've heard of guys that have to like stick a Q-tip in between their skin bridge or whatever to clean it out. Yep. Uh, erectile dysfunction. Now, erectile dysfunction is caused by two things, uh, or would be I, the way I see it. Um, you've got the physical, you're missing physical parts, whatever, that would reduce the reason for your penis to become erect, or become excited, or whatever. But you also have the, the brain, which you know, a lot of people refer to as the largest um, sexual organ. Uh, it, when when some of us recognize that we're missing something down there, uh, our brain kind of kicks in. It's like, you know, I wonder why it would be different or, you know, I, I'm mad that I'm missing something or I might, I'm mad that I'm missing out or whatever. And that's likely to be a turnoff. And yeah, it's going to be harder to have, uh, get, erect, get an erection. And then you were referring to, we were talking about the general botches too, about you know, how things get cut too, you know, too much, too little, wrong direction or, or whatever. We end up with curved penises or- That, they, that urologist blog about corrections is nauseating. Yeah. The, the, the volume that that guy is doing, and that's one doctor in one office that's talking about it. Mm-hmm. And then nationally, I can't imagine. I mean, it, it, it's just boggling that this stuff's not- recorded and yeah. kept and tracked as soon as they did it, it have to be illegal yeah and then we have the herpes you know issues with the moils that uh, from the ultra orthodox uh, jews that every that, year uh, there's an article yeah, about that in new york yeah. every I, single year for the last 20 something years yeah there's an article about the moles giving kids stds in new york yeah just saw a video yesterday of a guy that was complaining about that it, Brand new year, and here's another article about four boys getting every herpes. single year. Yeah. And the and a couple other. If you add mayor to the search, um, whatever mayor at the time in New York will have that statement of we're going to let them do it on their own. We're going to let them uh, 
police themselves. We're going to let them regulate themselves. We can't do anything. And the mayor's just step, the mayor of the largest city on earth. I think New York's the largest. Um, yeah. Just steps aside and lets yeah. them do it. Yeah. And it's coming up again since uh, Yang is uh, looking at becoming mayor of New York. So yeah, he'll step aside and let them do his uh, thing. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I hope that he has a little bit more uh, guts to stand up to it. Yeah, you know, it's not like that. It's like that prime minister of Denmark where she was yeah. for banning it and adamant 80 something percent of the population said, make it illegal in Denmark. And the first country with gay marriage, first country with porn, first country with a bunch of different things like Sweden. Mm -hmm. And she was adamantly against it and or against, you know, letting mm -hmm. them do this to kids. And there's pictures in the Danish news about like all the protesters in front of the Danish parliament and Jewish protesters, save our children. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was one Danish news article where you see the representatives of Netanyahu going into the Danish parliament backed up by a, a representative from the U.S. Department of State. And I asked my wife that because she works for the federal government, um, pretty up there. And uh, she literally like talked down to me like I was a Disney princess. Like, you really think that religion has influenced and controlled governments for thousands of years. What makes you think they give it up now? Yeah. And I'm like, why did the US Department of State back up Israel? Again, she talks down to me, which is okay when I make a little mental, <laughs> isn't everything happy and wonderful? No, no, it's not. Um, and, and she's like, look, we are allies with Israel. We have you cannot not back up Israel. This is something going back 50 years. Um, they're just, they're, they're allied countries and we pay them money every single year. It's a boggling amount of money. It's a country set up by lawyers. You know, they're, they're just, we get our World War II support to this day. Yeah. And they just, they bullied that prime minister in Denmark and the prime minister, as soon as they left the office, it's in the Danish, it was in the Danish news. Um, now I can't find it. Um, and I didn't bookmark it. I should have because language translations and search engines don't work very well. Um, and I can't type in Danish. Um, Maybe it's in the Wayback Machine. No, it's there. It's just, I don't, I can't type the right uh, terms, okay. but, but there's a, the article with the pictures of Netanyahu's representatives of the U.S. Department of State going to the office of Ferguson, whatever that lady, I can't, it's like 80 letters, the prime minister's name. And then she immediately flipped her stance as soon yeah. as she got a talking to, and it, it's a sanctions and aid and whatever yeah. else. So basically the U.S. just goes in and they're like, yeah, do what they say. I actually wrote an article on my blog about a law that was passed during the Obama era. Uh, it refers to a, um, a law that was passed about international relationships, and it specifically called out male circumcision. So anyone, any country that persecutes uh, whoever over male circumcision um, becomes an enemy or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, luckily, we have some freedom of speech here in the US. It seems kind of limited, especially with uh, Google and Facebook and everything, and everyone else uh, censoring us to a certain extent, but we keep trying. Okay, uh, any other physical harms that uh, you want to talk about yourself? I know that it causes the loss of feeling in males because when I was uh, in college, I could actually feel something with condoms on. Um, and then I want to say in my 30s, it got to the point where just feeling nothing with a condom on, like there was barely any feeling. And um, I, now I know it's, it's progressive keratosis that all male victims get. They're, it's just, you're going to get it. And um, becoming aware of that, and, and I've noticed in some of the forums, there's older guys that just talk openly about it. Like, they're just like, yeah, you lose about one or two, 3% a year. And I mean, they're just like in regular conversation. I'm getting to that point. I can have the conversation with anybody and yeah. keep a straight face and not, not get upset, not cry, not nothing, just like 
Okay. Right. And, and people's brains just like shrivel up and, you know, yeah. is it any wonder why we sell so much Viagra in this, in this country? It, it became an over the counter drug in Israel. All right. Okay. Uh, Pfizer litigated uh, to make it be sold in convenience stores oh, man. in Israel. You know, well, I, so I'm Viagra, for... Pfizer, Israel litigation. And literally it's like really? a convenience store. Yep. Wow. I, that's new. I'm thankful for uh, Alon Tavroni over there in that uh, country doing the bloodstained men pants uh, protests. So, yeah, there's some people against it over there too. Not, uh, oh yeah, yeah. I've, it's I've a little those. more dangerous over there. Any, anytime you get accused of being anti-Semite, send them all the Jewish protesters. Yeah. It's like all the all the screen grabs. They're standing up with signs in Hebrew. You know, save yeah. our children. It's like exactly. what? <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the next section is about uh, the sexual effects with partners when uh, not having the prep use in place. Uh, it affects a heterosexual, um, you know, penis to vagina, affects anal sex, and um, and for um, gay or homosexual men, uh, you've got to have at least one man to have his prep use in order to do docking. So, you familiar with docking? No. So, you know, penis to penis. They, oh, these are, oh. Yeah. You use a, you use oh, a force one guy has to be, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, so, this kind of gets back to the lack of moisture, lube, and rolling mechanism, but uh, since unless you really get that whap on wet ass pussy right um getting started with sex often requires more foreplay more time whatever and sometimes people want to get it done and over with a little faster but uh or you know people might get too excited and uh and get started before everything is well lubricated and then something gets torn you know like vaginas get torn and uh, I've heard of cases where men uh, would tear their inner mucosal uh, skin. Anything you want to talk about with that yourself? I had one ex-girlfriend that uh, she always complained about sex hurting her. And um, she was from rural Georgia. And she had once very quickly, I know she wasn't trying to hurt my feelings or something. And I didn't, that, that was before the awakening. Yeah. And at the time, all it did was like frustrate me and made me a little bit angry. But she had told me like, I prefer intact guys. She lives in New Zealand now. <laughs> and um, I'm take that there. <laughs> yeah, she just said, uh, I, I prefer intact guys because it's a little bit different for me. And whatever, whatever she said, um, you know, I was just like, ah, yeah. you know, and that relation didn't work. And uh, for some reason, she kept in touch. And she told me, she's like, yeah, I just had it with America. I moved to New Zealand, which happens to be an intact nation, you know. And um, so she and she grew up in rural Georgia, which I guess maybe her little tiny town, they just didn't do that. I don't know, because I know there's, there are rural communities that just don't do it. Um, but that's more of a they don't have the opportunity, you know, like the, the financial influence just hasn't gotten there because there's a town doctor. And it's yeah. like, he just if he doesn't, he doesn't, you know. And uh, my current wife, my wife now, which hopefully will be forever, but she's like, it works. What are you complaining about? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I mean, there in her attitude, there are worse atrocities in the world to worry about. Yeah, I just learned this year. I'm getting a little yeah. bit calmer. I'm getting a little bit burned out on it. I'm just getting like, I just learned that this is like that her that they're literally, and I, you can well, you can walk up to a Q supporter if you ever have a conversation with those people. Yeah. Check it out. There's Amazon baby parts on Amazon. And you yeah. show, look, there's a link. You want to see it? Baby parts on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Their head pops in like, yeah. I don't know what happens to them after that, but I've told a few Q supporters like that. Look, yeah. there's baby parts on Amazon. Uh, you know, so, I, you know, around you, talk, there. you talk about um, other issues being, you know, maybe bigger or whatever. Um, but this issue has gotten bigger and bigger to me um, in my own head as I've learned about it and 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 as I learned about intersex normalization surgeries and more about female um, genital cutting practices and I've come to realize how much they're connected all three of them are 
they're all non-therapeutic genital cutting rituals. And, um, and they all come down to the same thing, a, a, a desire to control sex, a desire to control people. A woman told me the other day that she, uh, she works with children and she had encountered a, a kid that had been intersex. And we had a conversation about this and um, she said it, that child wasn't even determined in front of a committee. It was just like one doctor and the doctor's conversation with the parents. And based on that, they determined the child's gender between yeah. the parents' conversation and the parents are gonna be biased. Yeah. And, and one doctor, and then I've heard, there's this other guy, he's like a bodybuilder, he's on my Facebook. You'd never know. And he was born intersex, and then uh, as a child, they made him a girl, and then essentially he's like a healthier version of David Reimer. That <laughs> he coped with it, became outspoken, and said, I am really a guy. Sure, yeah. my balls were up inside my body when I was born, and I had a yeah. little bit of both, but why don't you leave me that way and let me decide on my own? And he could have like been a celebrity in certain groups of people, you know, to have both. And now he's, he's like a trainer, but he's been gypped. He has to take artificial testosterone and you would not know the guy was like in between. And you wouldn't know that a committee of 10 decided he was a female when he was four yeah. or whatever it was. You're, you don't know. You have no idea at that age what what you're gonna be you know and and he's he's a very and that was the most moving uh like i don't know where they in between or whatever they're called you know mm -hmm. um I, I forgot the technical term intersex intersex or, right. yeah they, there's also reference to dsd uh, development of sexual sexual development disorder or something like that. a disorder of sexual Dis development That's disorder. It. <laughs> hmm. yeah is or whatever yeah intersex um but but he's like he's just like austin mercury that he's just outspoken in interviews about why is yeah. it okay that this this group of 10 asked me a few questions and then decided i was a female mm -hmm. and this is a man like he really yeah. looks like a dude yeah. and you just like this is not right that they're i mean unless it was some ridiculously like horrible their penis popped out of their forehead i mean some some really horrific birth defect maybe then decide but if it's yeah. not that don't yeah don't. it's it's just a you know when you look at how the genitalia develop in utero it's like it starts to make sense you know sometimes the gonads don't drop um sometimes the clitoris is a little large and sometimes the penis is a little small <laughs> so you don't know where to draw the line between a micro penis or a large clitoris yeah. um and uh, you know, uh, people have this need to stick people in the boxes, either one or the other. Um, and there's this whole array in between. America's gradually getting out of that, yeah. ever so gradually. Yeah, this, this past four or five years, if you look on YouTube, just type in intersex, or, or the past four or five years, lots of videos of uh, people have come out talking about the topic. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I can't imagine one doctor deciding a child's gender just based on a conversation with parents. And the woman that told me that she's a lesbian. And um, I mean, I guess it depends on the day that they went to whatever hospital for their gender assignment, you know, yeah. how they wound up with a lottery or gumball machine, which is going to make them this today. We feel that we wanted a son more or we wanted a daughter more or something. Yeah. Um, I think as uh, Hita Valorio actually suggested that, um, we need to have two different words for two different things, gender and sex. Um, so sex is the biological part, whereas gender is what's in your head, right? So, and that's where you end up with, uh, you know, cross-dressers and uh, trans people or whatever. And I've also even seen a story where one guy or one person was trans and then later found out that they were actually intersex and they were changed and but in their head they were the other way around so it's like it made all of a sudden it made sense it connected mm -hmm. it's like okay so you're not just you know messed up you know some people think you know that trans people just messed up in their heads it was actually something biologically that is going it was in their body that actually made them that way everybody's supposed to be that way
So yeah, I just keep hoping that people will relax a little bit and not stick people into boxes so much in the future. Okay, so the next section is about the psychological effects of uh, not just us being uh, victims, physically, you know, having a part of our body missing and removed, but um, also how people in general are affected by what's going on in the world around general cutting rituals. Uh, so the first section of the psychological is the trauma from the cut. And you've already talked a little bit about how you were traumatized as a little boy and that those memories came back after you started researching uh, about this topic. So it sounds like you were pretty clearly traumatized by it and you were mad with your mo mom and you wanted. I might have been mad with her my whole entire life. You know, it, it's yeah. impossible. It's possible. I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. Um, yeah. I just remember being very, very angry, uh, yeah. like indefinitely <laughs> after that happened. And, yep. and the argument and my dad kind of just backed off and he didn't really say much other than he i know he didn't want me to get cut i know that he wanted me to remain intact yeah and then it just she won my mom had the pants you know she just badgered him until you know, he buckled yeah. so i wish he had fought harder but <laughs> it was the 70s and he went and married an alpha woman so so did i i mean but <laughs> And you just have to, you know, know when to respect and when to not yeah. to argue. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it sounds also like you've had some trauma as you have discovered what uh, what you're missing um, and the um, the some of the trauma from you've been having having a little bit of trauma as you've been realizing that you're less sensitive as you get older. Yeah, and it it uh it, it progressed from despondence to a little bit of anger. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely morphed uh, to, to just being pissed off about it. And um, I mean, it just, I, I've been unique in my life. That, I mean, just, I can help control myself with just meditation and mental clarity. Yeah. And I, I told my wife, like, she knows I can't climax if there's like a lot of noise. It, it fucks up my concentration mm -hmm. because when I do, it's, it's a mental thing where I literally flip a switch and I just say, okay, now, yep. and, um, Same here. it's very distracting if, if there's a lot of noise or something, mm -hmm. even she's like, we have to get rid of this bed. It's too squeaky, you know, because yeah. she'll say, okay, we're, we're good. You can now. And it's like, yep. I, need, I need to get in my little mental place and just like, okay, you know, yeah. it, it's maintain that level of zen and level of focus that's what i worry about is losing my marbles as i get older <laughs> I don't have that focus is because it you know get older uh, everything goes your brain your body everything as you get older yeah. as i've gotten older i think i've learned to control um my thoughts a little bit more and um like hush myself to sleep and stuff like that uh suicide i, I think you probably well you heard of david david raymer who, uh, that was the only group of twins killed by circumcision because the one brother blew his brains out then the other one did you know yeah. based on the grief of his twin yeah yeah people I mean, don't believe are... that when you tell them twins were killed you know, yeah technically they were you know yeah yeah because twins are really uh, psychologically um emotionally tied yep. um yeah it's been still... and i'm sure the twin felt the pain that his brother felt his whole life I mean, just, just seeing your own brother go through brother that. Or sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, or right. in between. Yeah. 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 Um, there was Jonathan Conte and Alex Hardy. And, um, I, I did an interview uh, last week or week before. Um, a guy's friend committed suicide, and he basically says that it seems like it was you know, very much a uh, result of finding out about the harms uh, uh, that he endured as being a circumcised man. Uh, I was talking to someone else, uh, Nokomi. I uh, didn't look at the list of videos. Uh, her husband also committed suicide. She doesn't know how much to attribute to the fact that he was mad about being being a pre-pushional amputee, but it was definitely a factor um, of like 
drove his anger. I think there was a uh, problem with his relationship with his mother too. But um, yeah, it's kind of a circular thing when you think about it because he um, had a problem with his relationship with his mom, um, who made the decision to cut him. Um, so, uh, so I imagine that the mom was affected by that decision herself, and that caused you know a whole whirlwind of problems between the two of them. And uh, I guess it sounded like you know her voice was in her his head until the day he died. Uh, psychological effects to children. Do you have any children? No. Okay. Nope. Um, so obviously you were psychologically affected as a child because you were cut as a child. Um, and then there's typically children don't really start putting this together until they're teenagers from what I've gathered, but, um, there's also children that, you know, learn about this going on in their world. And, uh, and I, I often worry about my own sons. They're teenagers now, but uh, they often see what I'm doing with intactivism, and they often see the excuses that people use for cutting off, you know, genitalia, uh, boys and girls even. Um, and they're 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 disgusted. They're shocked and all that. And I feel bad that they have to live in the world uh, with that going on. And then there's a psychological effect on medical professionals. You're not in the medical professional profession at all, are you? No, but I've, I've had uh, an ex that was a nurse case manager. My sister-in-law is a nurse and a lawyer now. And uh, my actual sister oh. is a retired nurse. So I, I almost have a nursing degree just from osmosis, just from being around yeah. nurses for like 15 years. Um, I've learned a lot about it, um, just being around them nonstop. The one, the two of them are like against it. They're like, this is wrong on all levels. My sister-in-law hasn't replied. I, I asked her to, oh, because because she had a law degree. I asked her to read the uh, Georgetown, not the Georgetown, oh. Cornell, the Cornell paper. Yeah, about, from uh, Adler. Yeah, because they're, they're suing Massachusetts and stuff. Yeah. And uh, she hasn't replied at all. I th If that wins, it opens up such a thing to sue dozens of states. I hope yeah. it does. Yeah. Hope he can get through the fight. He can find some lawyers to help him because he's going to go up against a monster. I mean, there's just going to be like they're going to send some super lawyer against him. <laughs> yeah, uh, but he put together quite a case. I've seen his presentation that uh, with the genital Tommy um, uh, meeting they used to have once every other year. Um, that's supposed to start up again, but. COVID kind of caused a problem with that last year. But anyways, it'll be interesting to see what happens. He goes to court soon, right? It's very soon. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't been keeping up that close. Of it's February. He has, he has a court date in February. Wow. Uh, I'm not sure what day, though. Exciting. And he already went to court. This is a continuance or like the new date to see where they're going to, they're going to do or whatever. There should be a blog or a page on Facebook or something where it keeps track of what's going on there. That would be interesting. Yeah, it's on the legal fraud site. You can click follow and then it brings to his, his personal page and he posts updates, updates on there. Okay. Let's look that up. Not often lawyers have the gumption to go fight City Hall. And literally, this guy's going up against a state board. Yeah. On his own. So. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. Already, there's already been some attempts to talk to like the California Medical Association. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I even wrote a letter to the medical board in California myself. You're not a very high cutter state now, though, right? No, uh, we're you know we have a lot of Hispanic uh, population here, and, um, and it's the like the progressive. letter people capital of the U.S. pretty much. So that's going to be what it's going to ride to civil rights on is mm -hmm. that's going to take everything to genital autonomy when that group basically just says. Leave us alone. Don't yeah. force us to do anything. It's going to start in your state. 
Yeah, uh, people talked about San Francisco being the headquarters of the general autonomy movement. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of true, I and mean, that's where general autonomy America, Marilyn Miles is, and uh, and Bloodstained Men. So, um, and San Francisco, uh, you know, is the town where they tried to, where Lloyd Shell failed, tried to get it banned within the city. What failed? What? Uh, Lloyd Schofield, it, it's talked about on the American Circumcision documentary. Um, they tried to, they got a petition of over 10,000 people to ban the practice within San Francisco. Did it work? No. Mm -hmm. The, um, uh, the oh, I forget, I'm forgetting the name of the organization, but, you know, very powerful organization um, took it to court and got it taken off of the um the ballot so and then uh, some sort of law was implemented by that um by that judge that no other town could attempt to do this so which after the michigan um state lawyer struck down um fgm it's like well he's saying states um states have their power so the federal anti-fgm law is unconstitutional and then here's a judge in san francisco saying well cities can't regulate whatever it was at the yeah yeah so now we're saying okay well states are where it has to happen so we need to tackle the states at the state level. Well, what do you think that thing about nevada not doing it anymore because it's like well there were a couple of states it was almost non-existent mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah lots of states um have stopped you know definitely put it into the state's medical um covering it you know, their medical insurance which decreases it yeah yeah but there were some states it was really low and it i mean like amazingly so so it's kind of like seems like that would almost take over breed like mm -hmm. propagate you know that look, that state has healthier men, lower ED, lower STDs, lower, you know, complications, lower infant mortality. When you lay the map over neonatal fatality nationwide, I think it's there's a 2012 map or something. When you lay it over the cutting map, they line up. Like they're just, they're, they're an exact layover. And nobody's done that study that the fatalities in kids and yeah. It just lines up, you know, the more medically advanced states with higher cutting rates have the higher fatality rates. Yeah. In boys. Yeah. Um, even SIDS has been connected to this. So. Yeah. Uh, so the reason why I bring on medical professionals, is because especially when I'm talking to medical professionals, I just talked to Sylvia Joy. Um, forget her exact her new last name but her um her maiden name is swan so joy swan and she's a, a rn cna whatever she's she's definitely deep into the nursing side of the things and um and uh, i've heard plenty of medical professionals talk about how it's you know psych psychologically stressful to work in um like hospitals or whatever where they're doing it so it's like they had to they first of all they you know they don't want to participate with it and sometimes they might even lose their job because they don't you know they take a stand against it uh or they have very very least need to you know quiet out the screams that they hear down the hallway or whatever when babies are getting cut okay uh the other psychological effect on parents um again you're not a parent uh, but you have parents uh, and it sounds like your father was definitely psychologically affected by this uh, i would imagine he he left the room i remember yeah. that like me screaming dad dad help because my mom was not she was participating holding me down and um my dad just left he just very i, I remember him being very uncomfortable and just um, out of the room yeah and then he was silent for a while so yeah. i don't know I'm surprised I actually retained that much of it. And I actually managed to like suppress it. I, I don't understand the level of the brain, how, how it could literally just be like deleted completely or, or whatever happened to it. Buried. 
here it comes. Hello, here I am. These memories that you didn't want to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, intact men. Um, you, did you say you had a friend that was intact? Yeah, he's the one that told a bunch of mountain bikers that he wasn't cut. Yeah. And he looked into it when he was in the Navy and uh, he found that there were no benefits at all. Yeah. And he decided he's like, I'm, hi, I'm Dennis. I'm from rural Missouri and my cock's intact. And why would I want to cut that off? It's like the best part. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of compare it to, you know, seeing people living on the sidewalks or whatever in tents or in, you know, made up covers or whatever. And it's like, I go home and I'm, um, I get to sleep in a bed and, and you know, heater on and stuff like that and i feel bad you know i kind of feel like i have like do i does why do i deserve this and they don't or whatever and uh i've heard I've come across in tech men that say you know they feel that they felt that way and you know, they felt kind of guilty or whatever for having not been cut or he they just giggles over it. that guy just giggles over it like it's a scam <laughs> Yeah. It's bullshit. Uh, there's no reason that the U.S. does it. It's just a scam. Yeah. I don't think he feels guilty. I think he's more pissed off at the United States. Yeah. Anything. He's just oh, like, this friend. is ridiculous. Yeah. They- well, we have a lot of intact male intactivists um, in this movement who speak out loudly and a lot. Um, Sam Sam Carnes, for example, is one. He got a YouTube channel um, where he and his uh, you know, he's gay and his partner from um gosh i got blank on the the country that comes from but it's a basically a totally non-cutting culture and uh and he speaks out loudly about how you know all the myths about it not being clean or even about you know problems with Moses and all that uh is just not good reasons for cutting it off and that there's definitely lots of benefits to having foreskin and there's oh, yeah. no law saying that men can't use coconut water vaginal wipes. They do yeah. a really good job of keeping everything clean. And yeah. they're they're non-acidic, non-alcoholic, um, antimicrobial. Though some receive alcohol, uh, alcohol-free coconut water wipes. Amazing yeah. work truck. I mean, I they're on bike rides. I've given them to people out in the woods. I'm probably like long, long out in the woods hiking, and guys are like dying, and they're like, uh, and hand them a little sealed coconut water vaginal wipe yeah in, in texas summers just wipe <laughs> you off and you know yeah. very refreshing <laughs> there's no reason that we you can't just look at the box and it's just for anybody you know yeah. anybody at all yeah. and it's coconut water so it's yeah. not going to really irritate anything yeah. so considering that your friend had a kind of a visceral angry response to the fact that this cutting is going on in the world that's a psychological impact Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he had a son and he, I remember him like, Oh God, don't tell me this. We just went through this, my son. And he must've had like a little bit of hesitance, but then just like, we went with the doctor, what he said, it's cleaner, like, or look like him. I don't know. <sighs> you want to hear it though. He did yeah. not want to. And there, most of their people were completely silent. Um, one guy that did organ extraction, I think was just like, huh. And, um, he he looked at it from a scientific standpoint like and he was latin american maybe he was intact i don't know mm-hmm. um and then the old guy that was like it's bullshit they you know he you know 80 something years old just he'd seen every reason yeah you know, for, for, not, for for them they're coming up with whatever bullshit over throughout the years yeah yeah okay so the next uh section of this is about relationships um the first part is about child parent trust. So do you think that you've lost trust for your, um, your parents? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. After that happened. Um, that I, it affected my trust with them. I, I don't doubt that for a second. Um, that it, it may have actually damaged my trust with my mom for my entire life. Um, just because I was old enough to remember it. And, uh, you know, why the whole thing was why. And I knew her logic was flawed about you're going to get penile cancer. And even at that age, I mean, I wasn't a sheltered child and I want to say I was like maybe six or seven. And my dad, he was already, my parents had me very late in life. They were in their late to mid to late forties when they had me. 
And um, my wife calls me the 1950s husband because my parents were born in 1930. You know, I just, I was raised by a different generation. Mm-hmm. And um, I forgot, oh, oh, when, uh, when I was an adolescent, not even adolescent, eight years old, he taught me how to use his 38 pistol. And he's like, if I'm ever in the hospital, hooked up to tubing, bring me my pistol. And wow. like, yeah, that, that's a speech for a child when your dad's basically in his 50s and uh, he's teaching you how to help DNR him, you know? And uh, mom never really got that speech of just, I'm going to punch out. She survived cancer, God to eight times. And I mean, all kinds of horrible things. Um, but I had a different upbringing for sure. Hmm. The only spouse I know is it uh, made a difference was the one that moved to New Zealand that she said uh, she preferred an intact guy and, you know, it hurt her. I don't yeah. know. Other than that, I, I don't know if it ever affected partners or not. I'm not sure. Yeah. And the current yeah. the wife now is like, it works. What are you complaining about? So, <laughs> she just doesn't understand. Yeah. And she hasn't done the level of obsessive two months of reading that I did, you know? Mm-hmm. I understand. As a father myself, I really want my children to trust me. I want them to, um, yeah, I just, I really want them to trust me. It's pretty important that they feel safe to tell me whatever they want to, what they need to say. I mean, there's nothing that replaces a parent. Um, I don't think there's ever any way that a, any other person can replace that relationship. Uh, co-parenting, uh, again, you're not a parent, but, uh, it does sound like there was, a, a challenge with the relationship between your dad and your mom. Uh, so that's how the co-parenting issue comes up here. So, uh, that creates a rift between parents. Sometimes, uh, I've often heard of cases where people got divorced over this issue. Yeah. I wish that my parents had pushed that level. You know, if my right. dad had maybe been a little bit more forceful he probably could have uh got my mom to back down if he was because i remember that like he's like i'm fine there's nothing wrong with it and um my mom's argument was uh you don't know what kind of world he's going to go into that was what she said i don't know yeah i was like what like neither neither of us do just let me figure it out my own you know yeah yeah. Yeah. There's no reason to um, to not wait. Uh, people often think, "Well, it's easier to do on a baby." Um, it's you know they're not going to remember the pain. Those are reasons to do it to the baby instead of w- waiting and letting the yeah, adult do it. Yeah, that's one step behind. Uh, they don't feel pain. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, but my attitude is the adult can decide. They can draw their own dotted lines, and they can decide how much they want to cut off. Yeah, you know, they don't. You know, they might want to leave a little slack, or they might want to. Or the whole thing, whatever the adult wants to do, just get to that point, and then uh, decide what you want to do. You know. Yeah, and if there's anything, if they're unhappy with the results, well, that's on them. (laughs) That's on the individual. They can't come back and blame the parent or blame the doctor or anything like that. Like you draw the, you drew the dotted lines where you wanted to cut, so you got what you got. Yeah. Um, the mother child bond. Now you were cut later on, but this is often referred to as discussing the bonding time right after birth. Uh, the, the thinking is that when the baby is born, the baby needs to have uh, skin to skin contact with its mother um, and needs to be able to breastfeed and all that. And when the child gets, when the baby gets their genitals cut, no, pretty much right away or within yeah it's like days. they get the trauma bonding which is more or less and they won't it's it's like it seems to be different stories both ways of the sadistic trauma bonding or the not bonding so i, yeah. I don't know how it affected me i have no idea uh pedophilia um so there's multiple trains of thought on how this genital cutting, not just male genital cutting, but even female genital cutting and 
probably intersex, contributes to pedophilia. Do you have any thoughts on that topic? I want to say this is another horrible uh, memory, but the guy that did it to me that was my mom was talking to was very effeminate. And I don't think a two-year-old has gaydar, but this guy very likely was, and he probably did it with a smile. And that's an absolutely horrific memory to, to dredge up that literally I was probably a victim of a pedophile at like two. And um, it took me a while to like really think about that, but yeah. You, you can see the pictures like there's this one guy in like one of the cutter states and he has a whole giant website advertising his services and it's just the most demented jeffrey Dahmer smile that you've ever seen the guy could, could look in his eyes and just tell that like he is a sick sick individual that, that that's all he wants to do that's another thing about careers even my dad taught me at a young age do what you love and love what you do and you'll work less mm -hmm. and he's just smiling from ear to ear in all of his advertising like bring your kids in and on and on and on and, oh, have you seen advertisements yeah. wow yeah he's in he's in one of those car states um yeah. people talking periodically um just having I mean, like circumcision specialist in one of the brother cages groups or something mm -hmm. and uh there's like that's his clinic specialty yeah and um oh god i want the fbi to just haul that guy off and put him in a box you know yeah there's a moil that uh, uh, I guess he advertises a good bit here in LA. So I've protested at his place and got some pictures. But yeah, it feels very much the same way. Uh, doctor patient relationships. Now, for myself, I, I can't have, I just can't have a doctor treating me that supports or promotes general cutting, non-therapeutic, non-consensual general cutting practices. How about you? I just recently got a new uh, primary care physician and the primary care physician um, is a nurse practitioner and she did it herself. I even told my wife I did not start it. And the nurse practitioner was like, uh, she was during the first exam, she was like, she didn't go all the way there, like examining everything, but it was like an initial interview and everything else. And um, she's like, oh, you'll have to forgive me. And she's like, pause. And she take a little break. She's like, I just had twin boys. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. And then I, in casual conversation with the new nurse practitioner, I brought up anybody that has had a boy recently or is about to, or especially a nurse, should really watch Dr. Ryan McAllister's Elephant in the Hospital from Georgetown University. Oh, what's that? <laughs> okay. And then I did a very quick, like, two minute increases STDs, boys die from it. Uh, there's no benefits. It was faked by African studies. It's totally faked by the AAP. There's not one single, every other country looks at America like freaks for doing it. And I can just see the blood drain from her face and she got silent. She didn't talk for two minutes. And then she completely changed the subject. And that's like a, what I consider a super nurse because she's a nurse practitioner. So to me, that's a cutter response. Yeah. Um, you know, and I haven't had a follow-up visit with her yet. I look forward to it <laughs> because I'll say, did you watch that? Yeah. And she shuts, shuts down again. I'm going to call her out on it. If, if she actually shuts down, yeah. I'm just going to, because I know in the, in the typical cutter mentality, she doesn't know jack diddly fuck about the, 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 that. She read the medical book where it yeah. said, this is the section we cut off. And, yeah. You know, yeah. She hadn't no details. actually read any of the global standards. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And she just probably went right on along and uh, did it to her own yeah. kids. I don't know, but it's yeah. kind of strange that um, just from telling many people now that you almost, it's like a, it's like, like gaydar, but cutter dar. I mean, cutter, mm -hmm. you just talk to somebody and yeah. immediately just just by her stoic silence yeah. i could tell like oh boy you know yeah. she didn't have to say anything you just know that, yeah it's usually really clear i mean i'm not saying yeah i totally agree with you or whatever 
<laughs> they're 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 obviously cutters or they they're still very much in the dark about it yeah so. and she just had twin boys so they're double victims yeah um, yeah yeah and uh and so I mean, my my attitude is if if they are if they're wanting to violate their ethics their morals their you know the the first do no harm you know statement in that area or they're not wanting they don't take the time to do research in that area you know honest or, research or what their more attitude is oh i've done my research i know that they just they read one study and they read the other all the rumors that float around that little cutter group of the same bullshit lies yeah it's like it's like they don't go outside of it yeah and then there's a chance of this and that that's all you know, depending on her trauma level she could actually go out and try to find studies that reinforce her cutting attitude or she might if maybe she'll do an impartial shirt i don't know i'm just curious like yeah like where is the and like you said if if she's adamantly like i am right this is the right thing to do your university lecture means nothing to me i, I have to find you nurse, primary care physician because i just no. uh, that far with the head up the ass you know yeah if if they just go out there and search for benefits of circumcision then yeah that's all they're gonna get they're not gonna get the <clears throat> the other side of it As with lawsuits, malpractice botched deaths yeah um, fraud every, everything yeah, yeah there's a lot more to look for uh and then the last uh, relationship aspect is between friends and family um so for myself and i've known I know many other intactivists when uh when talking about this, asking questions about it or whatever, um, if not everyone, if your friends and family aren't on the same page as you are, this quite often leads to discourse between your friends and family, you know, friendships and um, connections with family members um, drop, stuff like that. Yeah, no, none of that's happened with me because most of my family has passed away. They had me very late in life. Uh, so there has been no. Uh, I, I sent it to one cousin up in Yankee land uh, that I met on like ancestry.com. Mm -hmm. And she was just like, I know, I know, I can't talk about it. I'm having a rough time with COVID and stuff. Uh, um, she was actually, I found out that my grandmother was kind of a woman that loved life. And she had my dad in 1931 at 15. And then gave him up immediately, like probably at 16 or 17, and then had five or six more children, like all in a row. Like she just kept pumping them out. And none of the children really had a strong sense of familism because we never knew what happened to my grandmother uh, prior to like two years ago. And um, it was all from the DNA test. Like I took that and I'm like, holy shit. I, I had that many uncles that I didn't know about. I went to high school with one of my cousins. Like I didn't even know. We got no <laughs> and uh, he was literally, he was like a first cousin because our dads would have been brothers. And wow. um, I, I didn't know that um, just from the DNA site. And it was all the grandmother's fault because she, uh, she was a loving woman that just, I mean, to get pregnant at 15 in 1931, you know? Yeah. And then gave my dad up at one. He he was one when he got adopted, and he never knew her. He didn't remember her. Oh. Wow, interesting. Those DNA tests uh, tell us a lot sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like a poster boy for ancestry because it was just so many family. There's a lesbian in California that she's a she was a Levi's model, and it's like a butch, tall, blonde version of me no facial hair <laughs> with any but she's she's a tall kind of strong woman looking yeah and i'll send you her page and she lives out there she's and she's a lesbian and um talked to her on a dna site once and all her posts are just like her and her partner who's she's really butch her partner mm -hmm. and uh audra's got a little bit tall and strong jaw you know what i mean mm -hmm. and i think uh we share the same grandmother that uh you know yeah. she's the daughter of one of those and no sense of familism. You know, they just the, all the kids broke up and did their own thing. Yeah. But I, I learned this from like one family busybody, which is again like a, a daughter of one of the uh, one of the other uh, 
brothers and my dad and um she kept track of everything and she was like um just gave me all the family information and she's like offended that um yeah and this cousin got married and didn't tell me and this one had a baby and I didn't know and none of the family's very very tight very um you know familism like the latino families have they are extremely strong that's an actual psychological term familism mm -hmm. um yeah. it just it's it's most dominant in uh in latin, latin american families yeah. they keep their elders forever yeah. um the spanish word for family is just familia so yeah yep it's an actual like psychological trait to keep them forever keep the family yeah. Kind of like that in a way myself. You don't see Latin American elders in uh, homes because they keep them. They just yeah. they bring them in the house and the whole family takes care of them. Yeah. You were talking earlier about that uh, that get together you had and the one guy got all angry. Um, he's intact and all that. Um, so you were you were with friends when you when the topic came up there. Um, mm -hmm. You still did any? Has there been any kind of fallout or anything about? No, just just that one guy that uh, stopped talking to us um, yeah. after after um, I tagged him in the blood stain in front of the Alamo. Yeah, and his, that one night he got upset. Obviously, he's still upset about it. I mean, maybe maybe he'll actually go out and do some research. I don't know. Yeah, I, I doubt it. I mean, if they're stuck in that hole, there's just no way to get out of it. You know, they're just that's where they are. Yeah. So I, and, I, and I brought him up on Facebook. I was like, hey, I remember when you said this. Uh -huh. And his reply was, yeah, I sure did. I share a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not inhibited. He just like, he'll just talk about it with anybody, you know? And literally he did. I saw him in front of mountain bikers he never met. So. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine why else you, uh, you, you probably would have been talking about something completely different if general cutting wasn't a, a virtual thing in the world, right? <laughs> you can tie it to a lot of different to topics. I mean, it's very yeah. easy. Anytime any woman brings something about bodily rights or, yeah. you know, it's so easy. Um, the guy's cock jokes. I mean, there, there's just, there's ways to sneak it into any conversation and make a group of people uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that difficult. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's, it, you're dealing with multiple taboo subjects here, right? So Yeah, it, it doesn't. I think that's why my yeah. wife wanted to get married. I just, I don't have a filter like with that. I just <laughs> never have. And, uh, and now I can do it with a straight face. I can talk about it and, and I have all my facts that, and I, you know, so I can pretty much cover just about anything yeah. and a pretty good memory with things. Um, yeah. 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 I'm at that point myself. I, you can't throw uh, an excuse at me. I can't, you know, react, respond to. So. Okay. Uh, and the last couple things, uh, I have FGM on here. Um, female genital mutilation is what they started talk, uh, calling it, um, like I guess in the 90s or so, instead of calling it, talking about it being called female circumcision or uh, some people call it KATNA, K-H-A-T-N-A. Uh, and the reason why I tried to make sure that this is brought up is because there's a lot of belief that uh, particularly amongst us um, genital autonomy advocates that, well, female circumcision or female genital cutting doesn't happen outside of any culture that doesn't also practice male genital cutting. So, and the excuses that are used for male genital cutting, male genital yeah, it's is exactly copy. the same, right? So the, we believe that one's not going to end until you end the other with it. It's got to be ended together, not as a male and female thing. You have any thoughts on that? Mm, um, yeah, they, I mean, female is always going to be less practiced, I think. I don't know if it'll ever end in the Philippines. It's literally ingrained in their culture. Yeah. Um, that That's, I did send it to one Filipino nurse and she was very, uh, very grateful. She's like, I will save this and I will send it to people. I don't know if she is personally a victim of it because she got to the US like in her 30s as a Filipino nurse. Um, so I have no idea. Um, I just sent her that and a couple of things of information and um, 
got a thank you, not a hostile, like, fuck off. This is wrong. You know, she was actually receptive and like, yeah, send me anything relating to this. So I don't, I don't know about the female thing. It's very quiet. I know there are the, what do they call like sanctuary play trips where they take a girl, travel somewhere. That should literally be like, I mean, pun not punishable by death, but quite a bit of imprisonment or, or so take the child away. I mean, do yeah. something that when they're taking kids around and I'm sure that the U S will get to that point where if they ban it, parents will take them somewhere else because they're just in their head. Like, Oh God, that guy it was like a, it was like an American guy in Thailand and he was going to have a baby and he was screenshotted and put in one of the groups about how he wanted to find out how to do it at his apartment because Thailand didn't practice it. But he's like, I have to do this. I have to Gosh. do it at home now. Wow. And I mean, literally he was going to do his own bris like with his mixed race baby in Thailand. Man. Yeah. And, and I don't know what happened to it. I think people are calling out Thai police around him or something, you know, like this military guy can't do this to his mixed baby, you know, yeah. just can't. Thailand doesn't do it, you know, and, and yet here he is, he's in an apartment and he's going to like do it on his own because he can't find somebody to do it. Yeah. What kind of mental illness is that? That, that uh, is he just appeal to their religion, right? Yeah. 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 I, the numbers I under, I've heard is like 1 billion uh, men are cut and like 200 million uh, females, women are cut. So kind of like a one to five ratio worldwide. So obviously it's, you know, supposedly really extremely low in the U S but like there was a case just recently, um, I guess a, a lady got indicted in Texas because she took her daughter out of the country to get it done. What nationality was she? Uh, you know, I didn't dig into it too deep. I just heard about it. It's like, oh. I saw that one interview with this one woman. Um, I think she was African or something. And she like didn't find out she was cut until like her 20s or 30s. And some doctor was doing an exam. was like, oh, you're circumcised. And she's like, I'm what? Because she got to the US as like a baby or something. Yeah, and she had on. no idea. Yeah. And her interview is absolutely moving and disturbing yeah. that you know just like a lot of guys they have no idea they're just duh, and they, they just they don't understand yeah you know yeah, there are several documentaries that you can just go to youtube uh, there's a playlist from criteria nipples uh, that i have saved in mind um where it has a whole bunch of documentaries from all across the world where there's different kinds of cutting practices on on females um, you know all depending on ages and types of cuts and sometimes in fibrillation sometimes not uh, how they do it and you know sometimes you know they, they do it outside and some some places they is medicalized so it's done in like hospitals and, mm. you know, a whole you know, a whole array of different kinds of cutting that goes on in the world so Okay, so last but not least, social productivity. So, uh, you know, I, my my thinking is that uh, I, I can just imagine a world where instead of people spending time cutting children's genitalia, um, they were spending time instead on, you know, curing cancer or, or helping bring joy to the world or whatever uh, or feeding more people in the world so we have less hunger um, instead of cutting genitals um, and then there's also people like you and i william that's oh, you know, spending hours something. every single day um yeah you know, trying to educate my people. friend my friend dennis at that night at the mountain biking thing after mike left the guy that had the mental like oops you know his mental went a little bit uh upset Dennis joked, or the old man joked. One of the guys that was an intactivist, and I, I didn't know what an intactivist was, mm -hmm. but one of them was like, God damn, the guy will spend days researching a GoPro camera, but he spent no time researching whether or not he should cut his own son apart. Yeah. Like days about a child seat or a GoPro, and then just like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, the doctor said to, okay. You know, but yeah. Uh, that that's rampant with most of society. Not all. There are people that yeah. go out and read and research, mm. but yeah. 
that he was one of them that, yeah, he did. And he did. He spent days re researching a camera, but yeah. no, on, on his own kid's junk. Nope. Not at all. Yeah. Or research uh, car seats or, you know, uh -huh. cribs or whatever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Higher, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely worth taking the time to research something that is going to affect your child for their entire life. Mm -hmm. And and affect you for the rest of your life if uh, you end up feeling if you end up being a regret parent. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's uh, that's pretty much the list of uh, things I cover. Is there anything else that you would like to add to this? Uh, I wish you well in your cause. Okay. Thank you. And all the other intactivists that are doing something. Everybody's kind of doing some different strategy which seems might be effective. I mean, because everybody's got a pretty strong strategy. Yeah. One of them's got to catch on eventually. Yeah, it seems like it's having, it's, it's requiring multiple strategies. Uh, kind of have to hit this from multiple directions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll uh, if you, if you want me to, I can put a link to your, um, your, your paper, your, your, um, it's like a blog article or whatever you put together on this. That put out did we put that up on uh on your whole baby or something like that i have no idea i know it's on men do complain and it's on yeah circumcision is fraud yeah. and then it's on also next level intactivism and i signed a waiver with some other company that was gonna make it into a podcast Ooh. Uh, yeah it's it's around like my instance of actually typing something out it's pretty rare and then yeah. if they find mine i send them the tail grusbix one where he got it at eight and he wrote another three pager about the whole procedure at eight. Cause I'm like, you know, if you want to publish mine, okay. <laughs> publish his too. It's just as graphic or more so. Yeah. Um, and he's on Facebook and he's like, yeah, publish as much as you want. And he, if you look up his, what's it called? My emasculation at the age of eight, tail respect. Um, wow. And a lot of sites have just ran with his and republished it. Mine, I have no idea. I know it's out there a few times. Yeah. I didn't name it. An author in the UK did, right. um, which is the, uh, Men do complain. They're based in the UK. Yeah. They yeah. they came up with the name. That's connected to uh, Fifteen Square um, over there in the UK. Yeah, I, I had no idea what to call it. They they named it Blade Raped, and I was like, yeah, whatever. It essentially is. My yeah. wife said it's not rape. <laughs> Look <laughs> at the encyclopedia. Look at the definition. And um, she's like, okay, you're right. It is legally rape. <laughs> yeah, it's worse than rape. Yeah. yeah. Or on a par. I mean, you can't, you can't argue with a feminist one, which one's worse. You just <laughs> no. Don't even go there. Like that's, you just, yeah. can't, you can't. Well, if you, if you ever talk to a feminist and say, okay, well, it's worse FGM or rape. <laughs> of course, they're going to say yeah, FGM is worse. Yeah. 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 Who, who need, it doesn't need to be a, a, um, a pissing contest though. You know, it's like. They're both wrong. And yeah. do all this together. All right, William, thank you so much for taking out the time out to do this interview with me. Okay, all right, have a good day. Thank you, you too.